Hi everyone, this is Professor Hall, and I know I have a lot of people who just watch these videos on YouTube, but this is very specifically for a course, and um, that is my women's memoir course, and we're only reading a portion of this book, so if you're looking for like a full analysis of the entire book, um, I would maybe try somebody else's channel this time. Um, so if you are in my class, welcome what we're going to look at today are um, some of the literary references that Azar Nafisi talks about in her book reading Lolita in Tehran so I wanted to take this as the first of two lectures the next lecture is just going to be about her memoir reading Lolita in Tehran um, but this lecture is really just going to focus on a little bit of background and information about three of the works that she focuses on in this first portion of her book. So what's interesting to me about the way that this memoir is written, um, we'll get into some of the style and some of the um, literary elements the author uses next time, but she's really looking at fiction and trying to kind of see in, in these fictional works, in these made up stories, what are the truths about life? What can we learn from those works that um, maybe a, a regular nonfiction book would not give us? So it's interesting for somebody who loves books um, to see her looking at these novels and talking about um, how these stories kind of shaped her experiences and the common universal themes that she saw in these books and the way that they applied to her life and then also the lives of her students. So just to give you a little bit of the setup of her book, um, I, oh, I will say we're going to read somebody else later in our course who tells their story through recipes and through cooking and meals and kind of that kind of connection. So it's a little bit similar to that book by Ruth Reichel that we'll be looking at later um, in terms of how it's sort of structured. So in this um, book, Reading Lolita in Tehran, just to give you a little bit of background, it's named after the book Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, and we'll talk about that book in just a minute. I want to give you guys some context for the book Lolita, as well as one of Nabokov's other works, um, Invitation to a Beheading. Both of those I have excerpts for you in our learning management system. So they're in Brightspace, and you are required to read them. They're pretty short excerpts. I just want you to have a little bit of understanding of the way Nabokov writes and um, some of the themes and things like that that um, she's going to be talking about. So that's what the book is named after um, because Azar Nafisi was a college professor and she taught literature courses and basically as the regime takes over Iran her position at the university kind of changes and shifts and she eventually ends up teaching a more personal class of a small group of women and she talks about who these women are and how the literature affected them and how it related to their lives as well as her own life so that's kind of the setup for the book um when we get into the first chapter, there are a couple pieces of literature, uh, the two I mentioned by Nabokov, and then, sorry, and then um, a third piece as well. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, not given its own section in the book, but she does talk about it quite a bit in this first portion of her book, and that is A Thousand and One Nights. So if you haven't heard of that, um, before. It's basically a collection of Middle Eastern folk tales compiled in um, Arabic during what's known as the Islamic Golden Age. So in English, sometimes it's referred to as the Arabian Nights. The first English language edition came out um, around 1710, um, somewhere in there. 
And basically, it, it kind of seems to be this collection from different authors and translators and scholars and things like that, um, with the roots going back to like medieval Arabic, Egyptian, Sanskrit, Persian, Mesopotamian, that kind of literature. So these were originally folk tales, but they're put together in a really unique way using what's called a frame narrative. So what that means is that it's a bunch of smaller stories within a larger book, which is very similar to what we have in the memoir, right? Um, that we have a number of smaller stories that have kind of influenced her that she's then created this larger memoir around. So that to me is kind of interesting. But basically, the, the frame is this, that there is a king who is... Um, learns that his brother's wife has been unfaithful. His own wife has also been um, unfaithful to him in a really ostentatious way. Um, and so he is bitter and he's grieving and he's ashamed. And he basically thinks all women are the same. All women are adulteresses and all women will betray you. So he starts marrying virgins and then killing them um, after their wedding night until he meets this one woman named Scheherazade and she tells him a story the um, on their wedding night but she doesn't finish it and so the king being curious and wanting to know the end of the story keeps her alive so this basically um, most of the book are is compiled of the stories that she's telling. So there's some love stories, there's some historical stories, there's tragedies, there's comedies. Um, it's a little bit like the Canterbury Tales, if you guys have ever read that, um, that also has kind of a frame narrative, or um, the Decameron, um, where there's a story of people traveling and each one of the travelers kind of tells their own tale, right? That's sort of what's going on here. So it's um, it's a really interesting, if you've ever read any of it, um, there are uh, just fantastical stories in, in, this, uh, in this book. But why does she use it? Well, basically, um, one of the things that she's trying to show is the way that her culture has treated women um, throughout time and now that the the um, that the regime has taken over Iran um, I have another video for you guys about the Iranian Revolution and um, I'd like you to watch that first but I probably I've already told you that but at any rate um, the Ayatollah is the supreme leader um, of Iran at the time that uh, this story, that um, Nafisi's story is taking place. So basically, um, there was the Shah and he was overthrown. There, um, by various parties kind of um, working sort of together um, during this revolution. And eventually the Ayatollah was ruling one particular party um, and that led to the um, change of government in Iran. So a lot of what she is writing is a response to that. Now, I will say, and this is something that I'd like for us to discuss, some critics of Nafisi's memoir have said that she is anti-Islamic or Islamophobic. And I don't, I, I would like you to kind of discuss that because it seems to me that she's not against Islam, um, the religion or the people who are Islamic, but rather the way that the government in Iran, um, which is an Islamic government, the way that the government is treating people and oppressing people. So I think that it's kind of an important distinction to make. Um, that's my read of it. But if you read it and you feel like she is Islamic phobic, I would really like to hear your thoughts on that and to see kind of um, your reactions to that as well. So at any rate, um, 
the other reason that she is talking about a thousand and one nights is to kind of set up this idea that there are some women who are um betrayers in this story or that they are um uh, killed before they have a chance to betray and then we have Shahrazad who has basically a different type of courage and that she's using storytelling to change her life and so that kind of sets up for us this theme again that um, Nafisi has this secret class where they are going to be reading literature and looking at stories and relating their lives to those stories. And so it has some parallels to Scheherazade that they're trying to change their lives or improve their lives or save their lives through the reading of literature and through um, telling each other uh, how they feel about these stories and eventually they end up sort of sharing their own life stories as well as they relate to the literature. So that is um, the first thing to look for. The next book that she talks about is the one in the title and that is Lolita. So Lolita is a book by the Russian writer Vladimir Nabokov. Um, it's kind of a difficult book to explain if you haven't read it, which is why I've given you guys an excerpt. I think the excerpt shows a lot better um, some of the things that I'm going to kind of be explaining. So it is narrated by a man named Humbert Humbert, may not be his real name. Um, he is very classically an unreliable narrator. He is a pedophile. He is obsessed with what he calls nymphets, um, and part of that uh, development of that term that he's come up with is in the excerpt that I've given you. But what I really want you to look for in that excerpt is the way that he tries to justify his own behavior. So the book kind of starts off with this very flowery, loving description of Lolita, who, by the way, her real name is Dolores, and it kind of makes me mad because many people look at this book the wrong way, and I think that it's been um, misused by certain people who have um, an agenda about children and their sexuality to kind of say, well, she tempted him, right? We use the word Lolita today to mean underage sex pot. Um, and the, the idea of um, this was even, most of you are probably too young to remember this, but there was this girl named Amy Fisher and she was called the Long Island Lolita. She was said to be having an affair with a married man she went to his house to confront his wife and she shot his wife in the face. The wife lived and this became like a huge scandal. Well, Amy Fisher was actually only, I think, 15 or 16 years old and even younger than that when she started this like so-called affair. In reality, um, you have an older man who seduced a very vulnerable, poor girl um, she grew up really kind of in poverty and he basically um, human trafficked her is essentially what happened. And that's the term we would use for it today. Back then in the 1990s, they were like, she's a child prostitute as if she really wanted to be in that position. Um, I'm not saying that she's entirely innocent because she did shoot a woman, but you have to know that that's kind of the way that this term has been used. It's been like co-opted basically. So part of that is because people don't always understand that Humbert Humbert is a an unreliable narrator. You cannot really believe what he is saying because he has um, almost like an addictive kind of personality with this obs an obsession, um, a very sick obsession with young girls. So at any rate, <laughs> in the book, he becomes obsessed with Lolita, um, Dolores. She is basically an ordinary 12 year old girl. 
Um, he describes her in very ordinary terms. She has freckles. She's not ladylike. She loves pop culture. Um, she's very dramatic. She's outspoken um, in the way that very young um, preteens or very young teenagers kind of are. And what ends up happening is basically he gets into a relationship um, with Lolita's mother, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte basically falls in love with him, but he uh, really hates her because he's a pedophile and he just is there for her daughter. So eventually Charlotte um, dies and it isn't really clear what exactly happens because we're told that she's hit by a car um, and that she she realizes um, what he really is. She finds his diary. She confronts him. She storms out of the house and, and then a car hits her. I think that because we have an unreliable narrator, it's not really clear whether she was hit by a car or whether maybe she was pushed. At any rate, um, Humbert goes to pick up Lolita from the, the camp where she's been um, going to for the summer. He takes her to a hotel. He says that she seduced him, where obviously it's very clear that he is sexually assaulting her. Um, and then he basically threatens to put her in an orphanage. And so she's kind of trapped with him. Eventually, um, she is able to kind of get away. Um, and he's supposedly heartbroken. I don't really know how to put that. Um, there's, um, there is a little bit more there that, um, Lolita is involved with, um, a playwright named Claire Quilty, um, and, and eventually, um, she kind of loved him, but he was also a, um, a pedophile basically and that Humbert in revenge for what Quilty has done to Lolita tracks him down and kills him so the beginning of the story and the excerpt that I'm giving you is him talking about Lolita um, initially and confessing to this murder and then basically the rest of the book is sort of trying to explain how the murder came about and trying to kind of justify his actions so he starts off by telling you about um, his background how he grew up how he had this love affair with a girl and it was unconsummated meaning that they never had sex um, and that she died before that could happen and he says that this made him have this kind of obsession with girls around that same age so which is ridiculous <laughs> honestly so um that's basically a very reductive short view of Lolita. Why does Nafisi use this in her book? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, and I think really kind of importantly, during this time in the country where she's living, a lot of literature is being banned. And so she grabs a lot of um, Western literature to um, almost preserve it in a way before it's no longer sold where she lives. So she kind of describes doing that. Um, that's the first thing. And the reason that I, I think that's important is that a lot of people hate the book Lolita because of the, um, the way that the author describes abusing children is done in very beautiful language um he he uses lovely imagery and symbols and um he he makes it look pretty the reason that he's trying to do that is because that is he's attempting to show like the sickness of the mind telling that story right but if you don't kind of understand the nuances of that, or even if you do, it's still very disturbing. Um, and so it's been banned in a number of countries, not just Iran. But I think that it's a symbol of the type of book that would be not allowed. 
because it is a book of um, so-called like Western decadence. There are um, young girls with sexuality and, and there's descriptions of um, people... I don't know how to put it other than to say it's a very sexual book, obviously, given its themes and, and the plot that I've described to you. So one of the other things that she's exploring in reading Lolita and Tron are the way that repressive societies um, affect individuals. So um, in her book, the real conflict is like, a character versus society type of conflict, right? And she's making comparisons to Lolita to say that in the same way that Humbert Humbert kind of objectifies Lolita and co-ops or takes over her personality and gives her kind of a personality that he is imagining, um, in that same way, the government of her country has looked at women from their lens and they've kind of painted them into a certain role um, and taken over their identity or attempted to give them a new identity. So she talks about wearing the veil quite a bit. And I think that, again, that's one of the reasons that some people think that this is an Islamic phobic book. Um, but prior to this point in Iran, um, in uh, prior to the revolution, rather, sorry, just to be more clear, prior to the revolution, um, the women in Iran were quite westernized in terms of dress. So um, a lot of the pictures that you see from that time are not that much different from pictures that you might see in the United States or Europe. Now, some of this was forced upon the people by the Shah when he was trying to make reforms. Um, so you again have two different governments, the Shah's government and then later the Ayatollah's government, kind of trying to tell women what they need to do and, and how they should be. So she's trying to kind of say that in a lot of ways, she and the other women in her class, and there are a couple men in her class as well, but primarily the women, that they're trying to exercise their freedom, their imaginations, and have some kind of like a self-realization that's not allowed to Lolita in this book when she is trapped basically by Humbert Humbert in the same way that they're kind of trapped in this very oppressive regime. So those are some of the parallels that she's making. There are a few others that I'd like you to kind of discover on your own and we'll talk about um, in our class discussions. Um, the other thing, again, too, is that when you then go back to A Thousand and One Nights that I just talked about a couple minutes ago, that um, story has Scheherazade, who is having uh, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of uh, exercise of her imagination, right? And so she's able to break free from the oppressive um, rule of the king who would have her killed in a way that, um, you know, the other book does not. So that's something to look for. Another, um, the last book that I just want to mention is called Invitation to a Beheading. Now, this is, uh, does not really feature a female character. Rather, we have uh, Cincinnatus. So this is by Vladimir Nabokov, again. And here he's telling the story of a man who is put into prison for some of his beliefs. Again, some of those are explained in the excerpt that I gave you. Um, it is a really almost fantastical, um, it's very Kafka-esque, this story. By that I mean that, um, like some of the things by Franz Kafka, it has kind of a nightmarish quality um, and it's, again, a man versus society story. So um, you have, it seems almost surreal. I put it that way. 
So we have Cincinnatus, and he is in prison. He does not know when he will be killed. So a lot like A Thousand and One Nights, where we have Shahrazad, who never knows if she's going to die and keeps trying to tell these stories. In comparison to her, Cincinnatus is really um, not just imprisoned physically, but also like spiritually. So he has this um, desire to write and to create, and yet his creative spirit is kind of also imprisoned. So what ends up happening is that eventually he starts to create this almost like fantasy world because... He can't believe that what's happening to him actually is real, that he's in this crazy situation where his jailers never tell him when he's going to be executed. So every day he kind of wakes up thinking, is today the day? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, but what Nafisi ends up saying about this is that in her book is that he has to enter into almost a strange agreement or um, a kind of, he's complicit. I'll, I guess I could put it that way. So it's not necessarily an agreement that he will go to be executed, but it sort of is. And that's kind of what she's trying to say. Now, an invitation to a beheading, it's a dystopian novel. So it, again, has this kind of um, odd, almost fantasy-like, surreal quality but there are still a lot of comparisons that Nafisi is going to make to her own situation so the first is that she says this this is a great quote from her book in this novel Nabokov differentiates Cincinnati his imaginative and lonely hero from those around him through his originality in a society where uniformity is not the norm but also the law so again we're seeing that um play out between the oppressiveness of society and then your ability to kind of transcend that oppressiveness through your originality and your imagination now at the same time she also kind of puts um not exactly blame but she says like he's allowing some of this to happen and you'll see that in the excerpt that I've given you where we have in the first excerpt um, this very surreal dance where a, a jailer kind of comes and, and waltzes the prisoner around. Um, and that's kind of a symbol that this is a dance. This is a movement between these two parties where one is giving and one is taking, one is leading and one is following. And I think what she's trying to do in her book is to make the comparison between her society and this society to say, we have to fight against this oppression in some way, because if we don't and we just kind of let things happen, we are like a person who just sits in jail and never tries to make an appeal, right? That we are um, allowing our jailers, we're allowing our oppressors to do things to us um, because we're not exercising our will to fight against them. So that's sort of what she's saying. And in a way, um, you might think that it seems like she's kind of putting um, or victim blaming in a way. And I think you could read it like that. But much more, I think, is a real call to struggle and that doesn't necessarily mean putting yourself fully in harm's way or screaming against the government carrying signs and and maybe in in certain countries doing things for which you would be um, arrested or killed or jailed right what she's doing is calling her students to um, think outside of the restrictions that have been placed on them. So like Scheherazade to have an imagination, um, like Lolita eventually comes to um, a place where you are recapturing your own identity, and like Cincinnati in uh, Invitation to a Beheading, coming to a place where even if your body is uh, imprisoned, your mind is free.
So those are basically the three pieces of literature that I hope now you have a little bit of a better understanding. And next time I'm going to talk a little bit more about Nafisi's book and give you an overview and then um, bring up some things that I'd like you to think about in terms of themes and, and stuff like that. So that's it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>